So the topic for tonight is tshuva, and it's one of the most important things to 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 really know, because a lot of people they they do tshuva. It became very popular in our generation, Baruch Hashem, to do tshuva. But a lot of people they don't understand exactly how to do tshuva, or they do tshuva and they don't understand that their tshuva is not complete. So it's very important, the same way that you would get hired now to a, a, a great job in a foreign country, and the condition would be that you have to learn the language of that country. So if a person will get into a contract that he's making a million dollars a year, he will go to a, a school and he would learn that language for three, four months in order to get this job. So when a person wants to go to the land of Hashem and to Lachzor B'Tshuva, to become religious, he has to learn what to do. He has to learn the, the language, not the physical language that you speak, but rather the halichot, the, the, the path that one needs to go. It's not enough to see a few videos on YouTube and, and uh, to go once a month to shul. So, even though it's such a, a, a long topic to cover, I'm going to try to cover the major points what you need to know in order to start your tshuva and to understand, A, how do I do tshuva? More than that, how do I know what I need to fix? So first I need to know what I blemished. When I know what I blemished, then I know what I need to fix. Because a lot of times we do things, or we did things in the past, and we don't even realize that we did a severe sin and we have to fix it. If I don't know what's broken, I don't know what to fix. After that, after I already made the effort, how do I know that my tshuva was accepted? Maybe it's not accepted. And some people, they live their life, they think the tshuva was accepted, and they'll go up to Shamaim and they'll get a, a reality check, and they'll tell them, we're sorry, your tshuva is not 100%. You're missing part of your tshuva. So we don't want to get to this point. And of course, after I did all this, I want to make sure that my tshuva was accepted and, and that I can move on. So it says in the Gemara, in the place where a Baal Tshuva is standing, a Tzadik Gamur, a complete Tzadik cannot stand there. Of course, we understand from that that the level of a Baal Tshuva is a great level. Of course, the Tzadikim come and explain it in a, in a funny way by saying, In the place where a Baal Tshuva is he reached his maximum and that's where he stopped. Tzadikim burim enam yecholim la'amod v'mamshichim lalechet Michael el Chayil. The Tzadikim cannot stop there and they grow and they grow. But the reality is that the Gemara is giving a lot of weight to a Baal Tshuva. The Zohar explains, I mentioned it in one of the previous classes, I'm just going to go through it very fast, but the Zohar explains that in Gan Eden, in heaven, there's two Madrigot, two levels, Gan Eden Tachton, Gan Eden Elyon, a lower level of Gan Eden and a high level of, of Gan Eden. In both levels, Gan Eden is built from seven, seven uh, medorim, seven, uh, 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 not skies, this is already in Gan Eden, what you're talking about is the Rekiim, that's a different thing. In Gan Eden, there's seven Madrigot, seven uh, levels. The Zohar explains that in the first level, are all the converts that ever ever uh, converted which is considered the the lowest level in Gan Eden the second level of Gan Eden are people who who are like regular people that serve the Shem you know they live their life religious and they had all sorts of Yisurim uh, suffering but not too much the third level is already a high level of Gan Eden. In that level are all the, what's called Tinokot Shel Bet Raban, the kids that Chas V'Shalom Lo Alenu died. People who served the Shem uh, with a lot of love and had a lot of Yisurim, but they accepted the Yisurim. People who had a very hard life, they didn't have Parnassah, they lost kids, uh, couldn't get married, all the, anything that you can think of that got a lot of Yisurim, but they accepted it. They have the level in the, in the third level. What do you mean by accepted it? 
they, they didn't quetch, they didn't complain. They didn't say, oh, why is Hashem doing it to me? I'm such a good person. They said, okay, I'm accepting this Yisurim. There's a concept that Hashem constantly, and we'll talk about it now, that one of the ways of washing off the sins that we did from this life and a previous life, life is Yisurim. I'll get to it in, 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 a, in a few minutes. What is Yisurim? Suffering. 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 Now, I'm going to get in more in depth about the Yisurim in a few minutes. But some people, they have suffering and they don't accept it. They complain. Why am I getting it? It's not fair. I'm such a good Jew. I did this. I did that. I'm doing so much. I shouldn't get And they complain. If a person accepts the, the suffering and accepts that it came from Hashem as a good thing, then he wins in the th third level of Gan Eden. The fourth level of Gan Eden, it's a much higher place. This is already very hard to reach because in that level are placed, first of all, all the Hahugei Malchut, all the people who died on Kiddush Hashem, which is a very hard level to get. The great Tanaim were, were praying to Hashem to die on Kiddush Hashem, sanctifying the name of Hashem. Any person that died that was murdered because he's a Jew and died on Kiddush Hashem gets to the fourth level. In that fourth level, there's also people who, who, who served Hashem, Be'ahava, that really did everything with love. And people who are really going through severe Yesurim, and they, 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 they accepted it. In the fifth level, above the Harugei Malchut, above the people who died on Kiddush Hashem, you have to understand that people who died on, uh, uh, one of the Harugei Malchut is Rabbi Akiva. And, you know, we, we can't even understand the level of these Harugei Malchut. And the Baalei Tshuva are in the fifth level that are higher than the Harugei Malchut. The, the fourth level are people who are Harugei uh, Malchut, people who died on Kiddush Hashem, people who are, who are called Evlei Tzion, that all their life they, 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 they were sad for the destruction of the, of the temple. These are people that, you know, it's very easy to say, of course I'm sad that the temple was destroyed, but do you really live it? You, do you feel the pain that we don't have Mashiach right now? This is a high level of serving Hashem. So people who died on Kiddush Hashem, Harugei Malchut, Evlei Tzion, people who are called Beinoniim, not the, the definition of the, sefer, of the book of Tanya, that's a very high level of Beinoni. Beinoni means half mitzvot, half averot, but they, they had a hard life. The fifth level is the Baalei Tshuva. And the Baalei Tshuva, of course, it has to be the real Baalei Tshuva, not the ones that are like... 20% uh, Baalei Tshuva, and that's why it's so important that this class tonight we're going to cover what is the definition of a Baal Tshuva. Baal Tshuva, there's a big difference in Hebrew, there's two definitions, there's Baal Tshuva and there's Choser B'Tshuva. Choser B'Tshuva is a person who did a sin and who Choser B'Tshuva, he, he repents for the sin that he did, but two weeks later he did the sin again. So again he's Choser B'Tshuva, and three weeks later he did the sin again. And his Choser B'Tshuva is uh, swinging. What does it mean Choser? Because he constantly Choser La'avera. He constantly goes back to the sin. He understands and he goes back to do Tshuva. Which is most of us, this is the level. Because constantly our life is battles. I understand that I have to start keeping Shabbat. And then I keep Shabbat for two, three weeks. And then I go back and I break Shabbat again. So again I go back to the Tshuva and I go backwards and forth. This is Choser B'Tshuva. This is not the level that I'm talking about in the level of Madriga Hamishit Began Eden. The fifth level in Gan Eden is a Baal Tshuva. What is the difference? If I own a home, if I own a property, I am the Be'alim. I am the owner. Baal Tshuva is that he owns his Tshuva. That's it. He did not go back anymore to the sin. So, a lot of people in our generation are considered Chozrim B'Tshuva. It's a lower level because they constantly battle backwards and forth and backwards and forth and this is another level that one needs to go through because all these nefilot, all these stumbling is to, for you to grow to a higher level. But the Baal Tshuva is a person who completed his Tshuva. In the sixth level of Gan Eden are, are, are positioned the, what's called Hasidim and these are not the Hasidim that are in Bora Park with the long peot Nothing is wrong with them, but Hasidim is who a person who mitchased im kono, a person that does everything milifni mishurot adin. 
If the halakha says A, he does way more than A. If the halakha tells you this is what you have to do, they go and do beyond the, the level of requirement. This is milifni mishurat adin. That they did everything for the sake of Hashem. I'm eating for the sake of Hashem. I'm learning Torah for the sake of Hashem. I'm giving charity for the sake of Hashem. I'm going to work that I'm going to have money to give charity and do mitzvot with it. So this is a very high level. A lot of people think that they're in that level. It's a very hard level to reach, to be totally devoted to Hashem. In the seventh level of Gan Eden, there's nothing there. There's no souls there. There's, there's a pillar of light. That's what the Zohar says. There's a pillar of light, Amud Or. And this is where the souls go up from Gan Eden Tachton to Gan Eden Leon, from the lower level of Gan Eden to the higher level of Gan Eden. The certain times of the year, we spoke about last year about the auspicious times. There are certain times of the year, like the festivals, like Shabbat, like Rosh Chodesh, that all the Neshamot, all the worlds, they go up one level. So all the Neshamot that are in Gan Eden Tachton, they get a, 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 a weekend, a Shabbaton in Gan Eden Lenyon, and they get, take them in, and they see, wow, this beautiful place, and then they go down. So through this pillar of light, that's where the Neshamot go to. So our aim in this world is to reach to the fifth level, at least of to be a Baal Tshuva. And in order to be a Baal Tshuva, I have to know the stages. The first stage is, is to understand where, where did I sin. And for that, the Gemara comes and explains to us the four types of kaparot, of atonement, which of course for each type of kapara, there's attached to it tshuva. The first thing is a person who did not do a positive mitzvah. Positive, not because it's positive to do, rather because it's a positive commandment. I have to put filin. I have to say Kriyat Shema. I have to say the Birkat Amazon after I eat. There's 248 positive mitzvot. The Gemara explains that it corresponds to 248 limbs of our body. The same way that our body is built from limbs, our neshama, our soul, has these spiritual limbs. Each one of these positive mitzvot corresponds to one of these positive limbs. If I don't do one of these mitzvot, it's like as if I cut one limb. If a person did not do a mitzvot aseh, a man did not say Kriyat Shema, a woman did not say Birkat Amazon after eating, you did not do any one of these 248 mitzvot, the Gemara explains a person has to do tshuva on the spot. The definition how the Gemara tells it, Omed sham ad shenimchalo. Stands there till he gets forgiven. Meaning that if I now forgot to pray tefillat arvit, I forgot to say kriyat shema, I woke up the next day in the morning, <gasps> I can't believe it, I fell asleep, I forgot to pray. A man is obligated to say twice a day kriyat shema, one in the morning, one at night. And I forgot, I fell asleep, I was very exhausted. Right away I do tshuva, I can't believe I, 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 that I did it, I do tshuva. And the Gemara defines it as, as omed sham velo zazat shenimchalo. Meaning that the, the atonement comes very easy, just has to do tshuva. The next is a person did not do a negative mitzvah. There's 365 negative mitzvot, prohibitions. I'm not allowed to eat unkosher food. I'm not allowed to work on Shabbat. I'm not allowed to do this and I'm not allowed to, allowed to do that. These 365 negative mitzvot, and negative not because it's negative to do, rather because it's a, it's a prohibition. They correspond to 365 spiritual limbs that Hashem has. The Zohar calls it Evarim de Malka, the, the limbs of Hashem. Of course Hashem doesn't have limbs, this is in a Derech Mashal, it's in a parable way for us to understand. But the same way that we have limbs in our body, and we are a reflection of our Creator, Hashem has His spiritual limbs. These are 365 paths that Hashem can interact with this world. Yes? Is there a book that says like what each, what each mitzvah and what each like represents? In regards to the limbs? Uh, there's no, you, there's no specific book that I'm actually trying to compile a book like that from different sources that I find, but there's no book that says this mitzvah corresponds to that organ, this mitzvah corresponds to that organ, etc. Because it's very different 
books that will mention it. Some of them are Kabbalah books. Some of them are, are interpretations of the Zohar. There's no really a book that is compiled that's saying which mitzvah, what does it correspond to? Excuse me? A long, a long way. <laughs> so if a person did not do a negative mitzvah, the Gemara says he has to do tshuva, and the tshuva tola, the tshuva that the person did, puts the sin on hold, or in the modern day of age of explaining it, puts the, the sin on pause. You stop the sin, which means that there's not going to be any punishment at this point. The Yom Kippur mechaper, and the fasting of Yom Kippur, and the, the, the kedusha, the holiness of the day, will atone for the sin. So if I forgot something simple, I didn't, I didn't say Kriyat Shema one time a day. I have, a man has to say twice a day Kriyat Shema. I missed one. Sira, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm saying that the, this is a positive uh, uh, mitzvah. I, I did a, a negative I, 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 I didn't do a negative mitzvah. Lot a mitzvah lot mitzvah a prohibition. Right away I stop, I catch myself. <gasps> I ate this, this food. I, I cooked uh, uh, this uh, dish and it's mixed meat and dairy. I did... Right away I do mit uh, tshuva. My tshuva puts the sin on hold, which means that in Shamaim right now they take the sin and they're putting it on hold. Okay, nothing's happening. There's no dinim, there's no judgment, and we're waiting now for the judgment day. Then comes Yom Kippur, and I fast, and I pray, and I give charity, and I do all the things I need to do, and the day atones for the sin. Does it matter how big that is? This is all the mitzvot, all the prayer uh, trend, trends. That's why you, if you wait two minutes, you'll hear the difference between these mitzvot. The, the sins, I mean. All these negative mitzvot, these prohibitions, these are about simple things. That I mixed something, I did something small by mistake. In a second, I'll explain to the more severe sins. If a person just didn't do one of the 365 prohibitions, and he figured it out, he realized, he does tshuva, the tshuva puts the sin on hold, there's not going to be any punishment, there's not going to be any judgment, he has to wait to Yom Kippur, and Yom Kippur erases the sin. Then, I'm sorry, but unless it's ben adam that's a total different thing. That's a total different thing. I'm talking about mitzvot, that, that adam between adam uh, a man and, and Hashem. Then comes all the mitzvot that fall under the category of karet and mitabide shamayim. There's 36 sins that the, the, the reaction or the punishment of that sin is called karet. Karet means to be gets chopped off. And there's a lot of sins that the punishment is death by the heavenly court. All the sins that have to do with these two types of sins, then the Gemara says that tshuva tola, then yom kippurim tole, which means that tshuva and yom kippurim, they put the sin on hold, and then the person has to go through suffering to, to, to what's called ligmoret kapara. I'm going to get to this in a minute in more in depth because these are the important ones. And then the fourth type is only one sin that we probably all sinned with. And this is called Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem, there's no tshuva in this world. There's no kapara in this world. If a person desecrated the name of Hashem in this world, the death, Hamita Mechaperet. Which means if a person did Chilul Hashem in this world, and it can be many different things, it can be me looking like this, cursing as somebody non-Jewish, and everybody looking at me and saying, oh, look at this Jew, how he behaved. Means me going, somebody knows that I'm Jewish, and I'm going and stealing from somebody not, not Jewish, and so forth, and can be many different examples. But the sin of Chilul Hashem, Tshuva, will help, but the kapara, the atonement, is only when the person dies. We learn it that when we read last week the Ten Commandments, the Gemara says that the first commandment, when Hashem says, Anochi Hashem lokecha sherotzitiha meretz mitzchaim, miyad parcha nishmatam. The second that Hashem spoke, they all died. And then Hashem took the dew of the triyat metim of the resurrection of the dead, and brought them back to life again. What's the point? Why did Hashem do it? Why did Hashem have to kill everybody and then resurrect them? Because they all had the sin of 
חילול השם. Which means for them to reach to the level of the Kabbalah the Torah, to accept the Torah, they had to get to a level of tzedikim, they had to die. They had to be atoned for the sin of Chilul Hashem. That's the reason, one of many, that they all died in the first Dibra. So, we see here four types of Averot. Not doing a positive commandment, which seemingly the Tshuva is very simple. I just have to do Tshuva, and that's it. And I'm forgiven. Soon we're going to get to the definition, what is Tshuva, that I gain that. Then I have a prohibition that I didn't do any of the 365 prohibitions, but they're not so serious. Then I do tshuva, I don't get punished, I don't get judged. The din, the judgment is put on hold. Tshuva tola. Yom Kippur mechaper, comes the day of Yom Kippur, and it washes off the sin. And I'm good to go. Nothing happened. Then comes all the sins that are severe, fall under the category of karet, and mitabi de shamayim. And these are the most important ones that we need to concentrate on, because we all fell in them especially the ones of us that are completely Baal Tshuva, because one of them is Chilul Shabbat, not keeping Shabbat. One of them <coughs> is Chalashon Ara. One of them is Brit Mila, circumcision. All the forbidden relations, and a few more. I'm not going to get into the whole list of them, but the ones that we really, really, really need to concentrate on them is Shabbat, Chametz on Pesach, all the sins of Pesach, eating Chametz, seeing Chametz, owning Chametz, and so far, excuse me? Seeing, this is the most important thing. Seeing, yeah. Uh, not seeing your own, not seeing your, somebody, your neighbor's chametz. Your own chametz. You're not allowed to own chametz. And if you see the chametz, yeah, that's one of the prohibitions. So all the issues of Pesach is, is karet. Eating on Yom Kippur, working on Yom Kippur, all the melachot that we do on Yom Kippur is karet. So any normal person that lived his life a normal life as a secular person failed in Shabbat, failed in Yom Kippur, failed in Pesach and Lashon Ara and many other things and all the forbidden relations, men and women together. In forbidden relations, I'm not going to count them all, but man and man, man uh, with a married woman, a married woman with a man, and so, and so forth. A woman that he's in her, in her uh, monthly period, with her, even with her husband, all these sins are falling under the category of karet. Karet, to explain it in two words, we said before that for 248 positive mitzvot that we have, it corresponds to the 248 limbs in our body. The 365 prohibitions that we have corresponds to the limbs of Hashem. Together, it's, it's 613 mitzvot corresponding to 613 chambers or channels or I like calling it fiber optics it's more to our generation plus the seven mitzvot of the sages comes to 620 mitzvot corresponding to what the Zohar is talking about about the 620 pillars of light Tarach Amudei Or there are 600 pillars of light godly light that this godly light travels between the sup supreme world and this world and if I keep all 620 mitzvot in completion, then this pillar of light is 100% in completion. If I didn't do one mitzvah, then one channel got cut off. One pillar. I like calling it fiber, fiber optics only from the reason because if you look at the fiber, fiber optic cable, it's very, very thin. But microscopically, if you enlarge it, there's endless amount of, uh, amount of fibers in there. So the Zohar explains that our soul is connected to Hashem with his 613 fibers. So if I keep all the mitzvot in completion, I have no problem. My connection to Hashem is 100%. And if I don't keep all of them in completion, then my connection is not so good. And to give an example that more talks to us, if you remember 10 years ago, the connection we had to the internet was what's called dial-up. You had to have, hook it to a modem, and then you, you would hear this funny noise, like this, and if you want to send an email, it will take you 10 minutes till the email will send, and if you want to watch a movie, it will take you two hours to start streaming it. Why? Because the connection was very, very narrow, very small. Today, the connection to the internet is high-speed internet, then emails you send like this, videos you see like that. Why? Because the connection is wider. Same thing with my connection to Hashem. 
if I serve Hashem in completion, my connection to Hashem is 100%. What does it mean? It means that all the hashpa'ah, all the blessing that I'm supposed to get from Hashem, there's no, there's no mechitzot, there's no stima, there's no uh, anything that stops it. Everything that we're lacking in this world is because I created a knot in one of these chambers, one of these channels. Now, if a person, chas v'shalom, keeps half the mitzvot, and half of them he doesn't do, the connection is very, 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 very weak. Now, what happens if a person now goes and tran transgress one of the mitzvot that fall under karet? The person didn't keep Shabbat. The karet, the effect of the sin, cuts off the entire rope. Which means that even if I'm doing a lot of other mitzvot, it's literally like putting the gear in neutral and hitting the gas all the way. The car stands on the, sp on the spot. The, the engine just makes a lot of noise, but there's no connection. Now, it doesn't mean that a person, that one person will say, ah, oh, okay, so if you're telling me that I'm not so, I'm not 100%, that my 50% is worth nothing, that I'm not going to even do the 50%, then that's not the etzah. Why? Because when I do mitzvot, even though maybe it's not going to the right place, it still stays in the spiritual bank. Kabbalah explains that when I do a mitzvah and it's not going up to Shamaim to its source because whatever reason, mainly because I did a sin, then this, the, this godly light that is created by the mitzvah is trapped in the klipa right now. Klipa is a shell. Klipa is a negative entity. It's a, it's a, a like a, I call it a, a, a spiritual infection. The same way that in the body there's an infection and it's infecting negatively a certain area. This klipa, this negative energy that is created by my own sin, and I feed it with my own sins, this klipa, like a shell, covers the same way that a shell covers the, the fruit, this klipa covers my soul. So if I'm going to take an orange now, I can't eat the peel, it's bitter, it's not even edible. I have to peel the orange and I eat the, only the fruit. Same idea as this klipa. I create now, I do a sin. Right away I create this klipa, this shell that covers my neshama. What really it does, it dims the light of my neshama. So if a person does a lot of sins, then the light of the neshama is so dimmed that the person has this coldness to, to Hashem. So you tell that person, you want to do a certain mitzvah? Ah, leave me alone. So you see a person that is very secular, there's so much klipot around the soul that you come to that person and you tell him, you want to put filin on? Ah, no, leave me alone. I don't want to hear about it. You want to come for a Shabbat meal? Ah, I'm going to a party, leave me alone. I don't want to hear about it. Why? Because the soul is so hidden, they don't have any sensitivity to Hashem. And then when they start doing tshuva, they start breaking all these klipot and then there's more sensitivity. Now what happens is if I'm doing half mitzvot, half averot, then my mitzvot come with a lot of kshayim, with a lot of toil, toil. Why? Because I come to do the mitzvah, but I did yesterday three sins, my klipa is overpowering me. I want to wake up in the morning to go to pray. The klipa is like, nah, stay to sleep. What are you pretending? You're pretending you're religious. Yesterday you did this, the day before you did that. Stay in bed. You want you, somebody comes to ask for a little bit of charity, you come to put your hand in the pocket, your Yetzirah, your Klippah right away says, no, nah, man, you keep that money, go buy yourself a steak. <laughs> so, our own opposition is our own Klippah that we create. Now, when a person does a lot of sins, then the Klippah is in control. That's why we see that people are, when they have more sins than mitzvot, it's very hard for them to do mitzvot. And they have a lot of uh, opposition in their mind. They have a lot of uh, uh, this doubt. The klipot, I want to do one time, we're going to do a shiur about the, the type of klipot, because we know the seven main klipot corresponding to the seven nations that we had to conquer. Everything in the Torah that we learn, the pshat is what really happened. But in the spiritual realm, the mysticism behind it, there's a reason why Yoshua had to conquer the land. He had to conquer mitzvot. So there are seven klipot corresponding to the Shiva Amamim. But then there's klipat Midian. Midian was not a nation that we had to, uh, that we had to conquer the part of land of them. Klipat, klipat Midian is a very strong klipa. Bezant Hashem, before we leave, we're going to do one shiur about explaining the klipot. Because you can recognize in your life 
which clipa is now beat gabrut that it's giving you more issues and if you know which clipa is now bothering you you know how to dismantle it one of the main clipot that we're fighting most of our time is clipat amalek amalek we know is the nation that came when the jews left egypt what does it say in the torah asher karcha baderech that it came and it cooled the jews down amalek has the same numeric value the same gematria of oref amalek grabs you in your oref like you know how if you look in the animal kingdom the animals how do they carry their prayer they grab them from their neck amalek grabs you from their neck and they just kind of like dismantles you this clipper what does it do it cools you down constantly cools you down you get excited you go to a shiur to a class you go home all excited i'm going now and tomorrow i'm waking up in the morning and i'm going to do this and this and this right away cools you down relax don't take it too excited that rabbi is a little bit cuckoo and this is not really a mitzvah and that you really don't have to do and you're such a good jew you don't have to do this and this and this it cools you down so the thing is that we're constantly battling with the clipot that we created so we want to strive to get to a point that i'm serving hashem in completion because as long as i didn't get to that point i'm constantly going to battle my clipot now, the Arizal explains in Shara Gilgulim that we all are reincarnations. There's no question about that. And the Arizal explains that we have to come to this world at least three times to complete all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action. Which means that if I'm here now, me, of course, I'm a reincarnation from something. Can be a few reasons why I got reincarnated. One of them that is that I didn't complete my 613 mitzvot. Could be that in a previous life, and a previous life, and a previous life, I did 90% of them. And in this life, I'm missing 12 mitzvot in my thought, 15 mitzvot in speech, and 20 mitzvot bemase. Now, if you had the merit to read the Tikkun Lel Shavuot last week, you could read all the 613 mitzvot. So you can kind of figure out that 70% of the mitzvot has nothing to do with us. Has to do with the Kohanim, has to do with Eretz Yisrael, Bet HaMikdash, all the sacrifices. Must be that in a previous life, we were all at the time of one of the holy temples, or the Mishkans, that we were able to be part of this mitzvah, Bemaaseh, in action. But in this life, I can do this mitzvot Bemachshava, in thought, and I can do it with speech. So when I'm learning the laws of sacrifices, I'm doing the mitzvah right now with my mouth, because I'm learning it. So I need to kind of figure out that I have to do all 613 mitzvot in thought, speech, and action in this world in order to complete my journey. Now, of course, a reincarnation can be because in a previous life I made a lot of sins and the heavenly court decreed that I have to come down here and fix it. I don't know exactly what it is. There are ways to find out. Not too long ago, a woman emailed me in the internet asking me if I know why a woman, Shem Rachem, had to go through rape in this world. I told her, I don't know. Nobody knows. But there's a good chance that if you went through something so horrible in this world, there's a good chance that in a previous reincarnation, you raped somebody and the tikkun is midah keneged midah. You had to come back here and go through it. It's always this way. No. I'm just saying this is an assumption. It's always this way. Not always. Not always. No, essentially nobody knows. Only a person who's a real mekubal can look at the person, see the gilgul, see why we came. They're eh, very rare. I don't think even in our generations, maybe uh, on, you can count on the hand, a mekubalim that can look at you and tell you your gilgul, your reincarnation, and know why you're here and what's your tikkun. In essence, nobody really knows why we go through bad things. But this particular woman, I said, you know what? When I go through something bad, the first thing that goes up into my mind, maybe I did this in a previous life. And now I'm getting it back so I can balance it out. Everything in the Torah we learn is midah ke neged midah. You know, you do something, you get the same. It's not 100%. Not everything that happens to us in this world means that it happened in the previous life. I'm just saying that one of the reasons we get reincarnated is because we have to fix blemishes in a previous reincarnation. That's why if you, if you, if you 
following my shiurim and you started saying Kiyat Shema Lamita like I told you a couple of weeks ago, you read in the Nosach that we say, that we're asking Hashem to forgive us, Ben Begilgul Zeh, Ben Begilgul Acher. Maybe I did something wrong in this reincarnation, in this life, maybe I did something wrong in a, in a previous life and I had to fix it. So the fact that I'm here today means that Hashem and the, His heavenly court gave me the merit that I can come here and fix things. I don't know exactly what, there's ways to find it. This is not the topic right now, but obviously if I'm here, I have to serve Hashem in completion and I have to fix things that I didn't do in a previous life. So now that I know the four major categories of how I sin, is I know that if I didn't do a positive mitzvah, commandment, then I have to right away stop, do tshuva, and on the spot I'm going to get forgiven. Now it's not as easy as it said, and in a second I'm going to go to explain the positive mitzvot. There's a, a, a debate in the Gemara, what is more important, a positive mitzvah or a negative mitzvah? Seemingly, according to the kapara, to the tshuva, a negative mitzvah, a prohibition, is more important than a positive mitzvah. Because a positive mitzvah, I just do tshuva, venimchal, and it's forgiven. A negative mitzvah, I have to do tshuva, I have to wait till Yom Kippur, I have to fast, and only then I get my kapara. But really, more important is a positive mitzvah. And the way we see it is that the halakha explains that if I have an opportunity to do a positive mitzvah or a negative mitzvah, the positive mitzvah overpowers. And where do I see it? We are not allowed, there's a negative prohibition, we are not allowed to wear shatnez, wool and linen together. When you asked before about simple mitzvot, one of the 365 prohibitions that are not so serious is if I wear wool and linen. I, I was over mitzvot lo ta'aseh. I, 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 I transgressed a negative prohibition. I wore a jacket that is wool and it has linen or in it. In our days, you, there's a way. You send the, the, your clothes to check. They check if there's shatnez in it and you're clear to go. So these are one of the negative transgressions that are not so severe. So where do we see that a positive mitzvah overpowers a negative mitzvah? That a negative mitzvah, I'm not allowed to wear shatnez. But if you look at a man's tzitzit, this is cotton in linen. Which means that if comes to me the opportunity to do a positive mitzvah, it overpowers the negative transgression. Because my tzitzit is made out of linen and wool. But I'm doing it for a mitzvah. A mitzvah to say. A positive mitzvah overpowers the negative prohibition. So from here we learn that a positive mitzvah is much more powerful than a negative prohibition. Now why is it important to know it? Because once I already figured out, okay, I did a lot of negative mitzvot that I didn't do, and I did a lot of positive mitzvot that I didn't do. To do tshuva for a negative mitzvah is, seems harder, because I have to wait to Yom Kippur, but it seemingly it's, it's, hard, it's much easier. Why? Because one is basically tshuva. Tshuva has four steps. The first thing is azivat achet, not to do the sin anymore. That's the first thing you do. Why did I say it before, Choser Betshuva? Because I can now leave the sin, and two weeks later I went back to the sin. Right? So, the first thing of Tshuva is that I leave the sin. Azivat Achet. I, I don't do it. According to Allah, the major part of Tshuva is just Azivat Achet, not doing the sin anymore. If a person just did, doesn't do the sin anymore, technically, according to Allah, is considered that he did, he, 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 he did Chazara Betshuva. The problem is that the Zohar comes and explains that this is what's called a tshuva tata'a, a lower level tshuva, that if it's not a severe sin, then it's fine. Yom Kippur will atone for it. But if it's a severe sin, it's not going to help. And the person has to do tshuva ila, a higher level tshuva, tshuva me'ava, from love. And that will only help for the tshuva. There's a place in the Gemara in Masechet Sotah that it says that if a person does real tshuva me'ava, from love, then his sins get transformed into merits. Zdonot nefchot l'schoyot. But this is a very high level of tshuva. There's many places in the Zohar that it explains that for certain sins, tshuva is not going to help. Which means that one might say, I'm in trouble because the tshuva is not going to help me. But there the Zohar is talking about tshuva tata, a low level of tshuva. 
that is not a complete shuva, that I just leave the, the sin, but the blemish is still there. So if a person does shuva, the first thing he has to leave the sin. The second thing he has to do, he has to have remorse, harata. He has to feel bad that he did the sin. And a lot of us do tshuva, but we, won't, we don't really feel bad that we did it. We just do it, but we don't really feel bad. A person has to have harata, to really feel bad that he did the sin. The third part, he has to do vidui. He has to confess. Hashamnu, bagadnu. He has to say it three times a day. A man prays every day. A man do it in shacharit, in mincha, and kirat shmala mita. A woman can also do it, and required to do it. Here comes a more of a chidush, that mo most people think, oh, I did so many things, I'll go to my room, or in shul, and I'll tap on my hat with all my heart to do my vidui, my confession. But a confession also has to be face to face to the person you did the sin to. And that's a much higher level of confession, to come to a person and tell him, you know what, I stole from you 20 years ago. You know what? I cursed you. When you turned around, I cursed you because I hated you. You know what I did? And <laughs> so much more so on severe sins. Is that really a situation? Vidui, this is the Rizal, says that this is the highest level of the tshuva. The Vidui really transforms the sin to, uh, to, to erases the sin. And I'll get to it in a second, why the Vidui is so important. You know, you're saying, like, for instance, we were saying, let's say somebody, they said something bad about somebody when they thought something bad about the person when they walked away. And then 20 years later, they're like, oh, you remember that day? That was, how does that help, how does that help the relationship? The, the relationship is working. First of all, here is where a person needs to consult his rabbi how to exactly do things, because in some situations, you might make the situation much worse. But in most of situations, when you admit something wrong that you did, most cases, the other side is either holding grudge at you, either he's upset, either he's uh, in whatever, and when you come and you confess, it's like, ah, I waited for that day for you to come. When my wife made tshuva, she called girls from school to apologize for hurting them. And there was one girl, my wife said that she constantly was bullying her, and my wife called her and told her, remember when I used to be mean to you? I want to apologize. And that girl remembered, she was like, yeah, I hated you. You made my life miserable. So my wife called her after 30 years and told her, I want to apologize for being so mean to you in, in high school, fifth grade, whatever. That girl remembered and held grudge. This is a knot that you go and release. So some situations better to shut up. But you have to, you have to do it, you know, you have to kind of be smart how you're doing it. Lashon Hara is very, easy, very hard to reverse. Very, very, very hard to the reverse. And even when you go and you tell that person that you spoke Lashon Hara about them, in most cases it's not going to fix it. That's why Lashon Hara is one of the most severe sins. And to kind of understand the damage of Lashon Hara is there was once a great uh, rabbi and his uh, student came and told him, can you explain to me the severity of Lashon Hara? And he told him, yes, every time you want to give, you want to say Lashon Hara, Take a nail and bang it in the door. Okay, two, three weeks later, the student comes back to his rabbi and he tells him, Rabbi, your, your advice worked. My door is full of nails. <laughs> but I still feel that I didn't do tshuva for my Lashon Hara. So he tells him, now, every time you feel like saying Lashon Hara, pull out one nail. So, a few weeks later, the student comes to the rabbi and he tells him, Rabbi, I, I, I pulled all the nails out. Now tell me, how do I do tshuva for Lashon Hara? So he says, can you cover all the holes in the door? He's like, no. He's like, that's the, that's the damage you did with Lashon Hara. Even though you pulled it out, you did tshuva, you stopped. The hole is still there. So to fix Lashon Hara is very hard. One of the ways to, fix, to fixing Lashon Hara is to keep Shabbat. And not only to keep Shabbat, in general, Shabbat is the remedy for all the problems. Because... When a person does a sin, the act that he does, it's called in the, the, the Lashon of Kabbalah, Perud, separation. Every time that I did something against Hashem's will, I did a separation. I separated some type of a spiritual godly connection, Yehuda Ila'a, in the world above. When I made a sin, I'm so powerful that I, I broke a connection in the spiritual realm. Shabbat is the ultimate Yehud. So when I keep Shabbat 100%, I'm fixing all those blemishes. 
Lashon Hara is mainly fixed. A, you have to stop saying it. B, is by keeping Shabbat, aval exactly how you have to do it, Behidur, and making your Shabbat table a feast. And the, the hint that we see that the table on Shabbat fixes Lashon Hara is right before you bench. If you look at the Nosach, in most of the Nosachim, it says, V'edaber alai ze ha-shulchan lifnei Hashem. Which means the, the, the peak of Shabbat, from the 25 hours in Shabbat, the peak is the meal, is the three meals. Which means if a person does the meal uh, chafif and he buys a few, no, I'm not chasr shalom trying to say anything bad, but buys the food and, uh, and then like making it like, that's not the feast Hashem wants to see. The, the mekubalim, the chasidim, they sing a certain song on Erev Shabbat. Maybe you have a siddur, what the, the song that the Arizal composed, Azamer Bishvachin. Maybe if you have one of the siddurim, I'll pull it out. I actually wanted to do a shiur once on that. Endless secrets. The Arizal explains the, the, the power of the feast. This is the, the feast. The, the, the meal on Shabbat atones for everything. So if a person really wants to reach atonement, he does his Shabbat meal like a, a Sudat Melachim, a feast, and invites poor people and, and people who, who will talk Torah. You know, there can be a Shabbat table with great food, but everybody's talking business. And it can be a Shabbat table with not such great food, but the entire meal is just Torah. So the feast of the Shabbat meals, this is the high time to atone for sins, especially Lashon Hara, to beautify the meal, to make great dishes for the meal. For the woman, you know, a woman doesn't have a lot of mitzvot. A woman is exempt from all, most of the mitzvot. But she has the hardest ones to give, well, basically she has to give birth. This is one of the hardest ones. For her, one of the main mitzvot is the family purity. But one of the main mitzvot that is hard, hardest is preparing the meals for Shabbat. Women slave over the stoves. I see my wife sometimes, you know, 24 hours meals and dishes and sometimes they tell you know you know you can you, maybe you know tone it down a little bit no no i want to make this dish and that dish and, and meat and chicken and why the sudat shabbat has to be perfect don't eat on plastic plates buy a set of fancy plates and fancy cutlery and fancy cups and everything shabbat i'm going to get to it at the end what, what's the point of shabbat exactly so you were asking about Lashon Hara, it's very, uh, well, very you difficult. When you said it's correct, it looks like, oh, you have no other choice, this is it, you're done with this life. Anymore. No, in a minute I'm going to get to how you fix karet. But you asked about Lashon Hara, one of the ways to fix Lashon Hara, the main part is Shabbat, and, the, and making the meals very, 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 very special. Not hafif. And doing Sudat Malave Malka, doing the fourth meal after Shabbat, the thing is, I don't remember where I, I stopped, but when a person doesn't do all 613 mitzvot, he's missing this connection with Hashem. Oh, sorry, we, we, we talked about the importance, what's more important, a positive mitzvah or a negative mitzvah? I'm sorry I got sidetracked. Positive mitzvah, we know, overpowers a negative mitzvah. If I have the opportunity to, to have the mitzvah tzitzit, then it overpowers the shatnez and I can put wool and linen in my tzitzit. It's a much more important mitzvah. So here we learn that seemingly when I didn't do a positive mitzvah, all I did to do is tshuva and that's it. The problem is with a negative transgression is I just blemish something that was already existent. I talked before about these yichudim, this connection in the world above. I just broke this connection. I just damaged something. When I did a negative prohibition, I just damaged something that was already existed. And why do I have to do tshuva and wait Yom Kippur? Because Yom Kippur just fixes the blemish. What is the problem with an, a positive mitzvah? I didn't blemish anything because it wasn't there. The positive mitzvah, when I do a positive mitzvah, I bring godly light into this world. Heara elokit. When I didn't do it, I had the opportunity to bring this godly light into the world, and I missed the opportunity. This opportunity will never return. So if I did tshuva when I was 28, and I missed tefillin from 13 
calculate the days, you're talking about like 5,000 times that I missed the positive mitzvah of tefillin. 5,000 times I had the opportunity of putting tefillin, of bring, bringing this godly light to this world, and I missed the opportunity. To, to make it easier to understand, it's like you calling off one day, you call your boss and you tell him today I'm not coming to, to the work. So he tells you, no problem, you, you don't have to come, I'm okay, but I'm not paying you for this day. So comes the end of the week to get the paycheck, you're getting one day less. That's it. Boss is not upset. Of course, when you don't do a positive mitzvah, the real boss is upset. Just to put it in a parable, you don't get your sachar, you don't get your, your paycheck that week. So when I didn't do a positive mitzvah, yes, Hashem is upset, I have to do tshuva for it. But I didn't blemish something that existed. I didn't bring down to the world, I had the opportunity to bring down godly light to the world. And the, world, the whole world is leaning on me. I'm one in an entire system. Which means that if I miss one day of tefillin, or if I miss one day of anything, I'm lacking, I have a void, I have a gap in the spiritual realm that is empty right now. How are you going to reverse it? You can reverse it. That's why we see that a positive mitzvah overpowers a negative mitzvah. Now, of course, we know from many different places, the Zohar says, en davar tshuva. Nothing stands in front of tshuva. Which means there is a way to fix it. There's a way to fix the, the, the chisaron, the, 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 what I'm missing from not doing a positive mitzvah. And there's a way to fix karet. The fourth category of Chilul Hashem, you just don't do it. And you wait for the day of the death, and the death will atone. And Bezad Hashem, you do tshuva for Chilul Hashem, and you don't do it anymore, and you wait for your day of the death. Bezad Hashem, it should not happen, because Mashiach is going to come very soon, and we're not going to merit to have that. But now we have to deal with the severe sins, with the karet. So first of all, I started saying before that the first thing is azivat achet, leaving the, the sin. You can't do the sin anymore. Then you have to have remorse. You have to do charata. You have to feel bad for it. Then you have to do vidui. You have to do to confess. To confess. And then you have to have kabbalah latid. You have to accept that you're never doing the sin anymore. If the person did all these fours, he completed, hold on, he completed his tshuva. Now, how do you know that the tshuva was accepted? Here comes the next part, which I'm going to get to in a second. But if a person really wants to cover the, the entire problem, then he first has to stop the sin, then confess, have remorse, then confess, then not do it again. And the Gemara says, how do you know who's a real Baal Tshuva? Hashem turns the world around and puts you in the same situation again. Oto makom, oto isha, oto perek, oto zman, that's what the Gemara says. If he didn't fail, he did the tshuva. He completed his tshuva. Which means Hashem will turn you around to the same place, to the same temptation, to the same situation. If you fail, then you go back to square one. Chazar b'tshuva, chazar chazara. If you didn't, then you know that you completed your circle. Now, the Arizal asks a big question. Okay, let's say a man sinned with many, many women. Severe sin. This is one of the, the prohibitions of Karet. Okay, so he did tshuva. He did the whole thing. Hashem turned it around and brought a beautiful woman in front of him that seduced him and he didn't want to listen. And he overpowered his inclination and he feels he did this tshuva. But he did a hundred times the sins. What, a hundred times Hashem is going to turn it around? How is he going to atone for that? The Arizal says that the only way to reverse the repetition of the sin is the kvidui. The ashamnu, baganu, the vidui. This is such a high level of your tshuva that when you confess out loud, this is when you reverse the repetition of the sin. Because if I did Chilul Shabbat a thousand times, okay, so I don't, I keep Shabbat now. And I, and I feel bad about it. But I am missing something. A, you know, let's say I'll come to the, to the point that I will have the temptation to not keep Shabbat and I did it. Then how do I fix all the blemishes? The Rizal, the, the, the Tsa, the advice that the Rizal says, he says you have to do Vidui. The Vidui is a very powerful way to, to cover up all the things that I, I, I repeated many, many times. One way 
which this is like the ultimate way to fix all the blemishes, both of positive mitzvot and negative mitzvot, is by me making others do it. So if I now calculate that from the age of 13 till the age of 28 I missed the mitzvah with filin, I'm talking about thousands of times that I missed filin, doesn't matter what I'm going to do, I'm never going to get it back. But if I now go to the streets and I grab a band and I tell him, you want to put filin on? And I put filin on him, he gets his mitzvah, but I got one down. And then I do another one, I got one down. Another one, one down. If I made a man put filin on and all his life he's putting on filin, I'm covering all these holes. Same thing with Shabbat. Same thing with anything. When I go out of my way to make somebody else stop doing a sin, that's how I get the highest level of atonement. That's why the Zohar explains that the greatest mitzvah one can do is Zikur Rabim. Zikur Rabim is going and making others do mitzvot in any way you can. Either you go with your body, either you go with your mouth, either you go online, either you go with your money, either you give CDs, doesn't matter what you do. You put your time to make other people not do that sin. That's the main and the ultimate way to cover all the holes. Which means that totally to sidetrack off the topic of the class, you all know my story, when I was given the opportunity to come back down to this world, and they told me the only way for you to reverse your situation is only if you come up to Sharaim with an army of people that you made them not do Averot and do Mitzvot. Because doesn't matter what you're going to do, you're going to reach a peak. So when one wants to really reverse the wrongdoing that he did, first of all and most important is to stop doing the sin. You cannot do Tshuva for any sin if you continue doing the sin. There's no chance, doesn't matter what you're going to do. If you continue to do the sin, you will never reach the level of tshuva. Which means that a person has to ligmor belibo. A person has to accept that that's it, I'm never doing it again. Until I finish doing it, I'm nichozer betshuva, ni not baal tshuva. Because I repeat it all the time. So of course, first of all, a person has to stop. And a person has to stop everything. So it means... A person cannot do 50% mitzvot and say, I'm doing good. A person cannot do half of Avodat Hashem. It's not going to work. What's going to happen, exactly what I told before and I didn't get to finish, when I do a sin, and let's say in the morning I did a lot of mitzvot. I prayed, I put filin, I put a talit, I davened, I, I, I learned, I gave charity, I studied Torah, I did a lot of things. Then in the night I did a sin. And the sin kind of overpowers all my mitzvot. Now, it doesn't mean the mitzvot go to the garbage. Rather, it means that it goes tachat memshelet haklipa. The klipa takes possession of it. Which means all my zchuyot, all my merits, are right now are taken to a third party. And till I'm going to do tshuva, all these mitzvot are... I don't have them. I don't have the zchut for this. Which means that every day that I'm getting judged in Shamaim, I don't have these mitzvot. These mitzvot are right now, are in the possession of the klipa. And in the day when I'm going to do tshuva, then I'm going to break the klipa and all these mitzvot are going to come back to me. So before I mentioned of a, lot, a lot of people says, oh, if I'm not doing everything, then I might as well not to do anything because I don't want all my mitzvot to go to the garbage. It's not the good, it's not the right uh, uh, etzah, it's not the right thing to do. Because first of all, it says, the Gemara teaches us that even if you're doing it not from the right reason or you know that you're going to do now mitzvah and the next day you're going to sin, still do it. Because you are pumping your neshama with koach and you're still going to get the sachar of the mitzvah. And I'll give you an example. I had a, a student that I met in one of my lectures and I, I, he started getting very close to me and he would come to classes. And finally, I got him convinced to come and pray with us every morning. And every morning he would drive from, I lived in Brooklyn, he would drive from Queens. He would come and pray with us a whole hour, put the tefillin on in the tzitzit and give charity and learn some Torah. And, you know, it was on the right path. One day he doesn't come to the prayer. Okay, I didn't say anything. Okay, maybe he's sick or something. The next day he didn't come. I call him up and I tell him, why didn't you come today and yesterday? We missed you. You know, it says in the Midrash that the person, if he misses one day of a prayer, Hashem comes down to 
his heavenly court and says, where is Plony? He was sitting here every day. Where is he? So I told him, where were you? What happened? He told me, listen. He tells me in Hebrew, listen. I feel like a hypocrite. I am not coming anymore to pray. I told him, why? He's like, listen, you know, I, I know you mean good and I know you're trying to lechazek oti and to make me stronger. But look, you know, I didn't come yesterday to pray because the night before I went out to a party and the list of the sins that I did, I woke up in the morning, I was like, who are you kidding? You, yesterday you did this, this and this and this. And now you have the chutzpah to show up in, in a bit knesset and to put filin on? I was yesterday with a... With a not Jewish girl, and I did what I did, and I did this, and I did that. Ah, I, I don't have the, 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 he told me, the chutzpah, I'm a, I feel I'm like a hypocrite that I'm coming today to pray. I told him, what, what has one has to do with the other? The fact that you did a sin, why should it stop you from doing a, a mitzvah? What does one have to do with the other? And I told him in a very extreme way, imagine today is the day you have to go up to Shemaim. And you go up to Shemaim and they tell you, okay, let's see what's going on here. And they open the books and they show you all your sins and they show you all your mitzvot. What's going to happen if they tell you, look, you have here whew, a, a, a bucket full of sins. What are we going to do with you? What would you do if you can show them on the other side a barrel of mitzvot? So you tell them, yes, I have a, a bucket full of sins, but on the other hand, look how many mitzvot I have. Maybe that will overpower your sins and you're going to be judged favorably in Shamaim. more than that this is the ultimate tool that the klipa will use when a person sins the person will come to do a mitzvah right away the klipa will come and says oh are you kidding yesterday look what you did now you're going to put filin on now you're going to do this now you're going to keep Shabbat yeah you're, you're a sinner you are uh, you know you're a poshaya you, you, you're nothing. Why are you doing now mitzvot? And right away he will make that person, you know, you're right. I'm, 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 Hashem, Hashem doesn't even want to, won't even accept my mitzvah. And I told him, one has nothing to do with the other. So you go to the mikveh, and you do tshuva, and you come to pray. Why miss a mitzvah? Because yesterday you did an avera. So do tshuva for your avera. But today you are obligated to say kachma, you are obligated to, to, to put filin, you are obligated to put tzitzit, you are obligated to pray, you are obligated to study Torah. Look how many mitzvot you're missing! Well, so what if you did an avera yesterday? So do tshuva. Kol you betshuva. Your whole life is going to be tshuva. So what if you sinned yesterday? Why miss the mitzvah? If I have a, a deficiency here, why should I not do the mitzvah? So the thing is that one should not go into despair and say, okay, I'm not really religious, so what's the point? No, because every mitzvah goes into your spiritual bank and one day you will do the ultimate tshuva and release all this merit, all this kudusha. But in the meantime, when a person really wants to reach the, his goal, the thing is that if a person doesn't have a goal in this world, and I always give the same example. There's a movie... Uh, how is it called in English? Uh, Alice in Wonderland. Elizabeth is a plot. And in this movie, of course, it's a, it's a fairy tale. In this movie, there's a part that Alice walks around and she has a, a, like a bunny. I saw the movie like 20 years ago. I don't really remember. But she has like a rabbit. And she walks around and she gets into a crossroad. And she doesn't know uh, where to go. I don't know if crossroad is the right word. A, a T. A T junction. She can either turn right or the other turn left. And she stops there and she doesn't know what to do, to turn left, to turn right, to turn left. Comes this rabbit and he tells her, what's, what's the problem? So she tells him, I don't know where to go. So he tells her, where are you heading? She was like, I'm not heading anywhere, I'm just walking around. So he tells her, if you don't have a destination, what does it matter where do you go? If you go left, you go right, what's the mission? So same thing in this world. If you don't have a destination, it doesn't matter where you go. You eat kosher, you don't eat kosher. You keep Shabbat, you don't keep Shabbat. You don't have a destination. But if you have a destination to reach to Gan Eden, then you, have, then you know what the decision is. If your destination is to reach to Gan Eden, you know your path, as hard as it might be. So if a person sets in his mind, I want to get there, I want to get to Gan Eden, and I want to win my part in Holam Abba, then I have to do 
all 613 mitzvot, not 50% of them and not 70% of them. I have to do all of them. Because I'm going to come up to Shammai and they're going to tell me, yeah, you were 70% good, you can get 70% Gan Eden. Why should I miss 30%? Besides that I'm commanded to lavod et Hashem b'shlemut. I have to serve Hashem in completion. I can't, you know, Hashem didn't give us tam for no reason, 613 mitzvot. He gave us because it's corresponding to these channels where I'm getting my chayut, my lifehood, my life force I'm getting through these channels. So when I'm keeping all of them, then everything's good. And when I'm starting to cut these ropes, these fibers, then I'm losing connection with Hashem. So in order to fix these karet, all these prohibitions that actually chop everything off, is the tshuva, the level of the tshuva that I have to do is have to be very, very great. A, I have to do all 613 mitzvot with no exceptions. If I realize that I did so many severe sins and I want to get to my destination, the only way to reverse it is to do 100%. And I see you doing how? No, because you don't have temple right now. Okay, so you, do it with, so you do it with your thoughts and you do it with your speech. If we don't have right now the holy temple, means that you already did the mitzvah b'maaseh in action, either in the generation of the, of the desert, or you're in one of the two holy temples. And I heard a mekubal not too long ago, I don't know, I, I heard it from a second hand, that he said that most of our souls in this generation are a reincarnation from Dora Midbar, from the souls that were in the Midbar, which means that we saw the Mishkan. So we were probably, were yotze b'maaseh. So now you're saying, how can I do the mitzvot with my thought or with my speech? Either you learn it yourself, and if you don't have the time or the ability or, the, or whatever to learn, then you go to a yeshiva and you donate a little bit of money and you tell them, I want that my money will go to learn this and this, and you get a partnership. There's a very, very famous partnership in the Torah between Zvolun and Issachar, two of the tribes. Zvolun went to be a businessman. He went out to the ocean to deal with merchandise. Issachar would sit and learn Torah all day long. Zvolun would bring money and they would split half 50-50. Zvolun, the businessman, gave 50% of the money to Issachar and Issachar gave 50% of the Torah to Zvolun. There was a partnership. So in our day you can also do a, a partnership. Very easy. I can find you thousands of partners like this if you want. I know many Avrachim that sit and study Torah all day long and they'll tell you which Masechet you want me to learn for you. I'll learn for you. We partnership. So there's koilels, there's the shivas. Don't worry. If you want, uh, if, uh, if you have the, 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 the ratzon, there's how to do it. If there's a wheel, there's a way. 